If you saw my last video, I spent the last week building an app to get it ready for the first 10 users. I'm excited to say we pulled it off and there are now 10 people using the app. I wanna move quickly and capitalize on the momentum we have. There's a lot of interest in this app. There's like a thousand people on the wait list. So I gave myself one week to iterate on the feedback that I got, work on retention, and make sure that the app was ready for the next 200 users that I wanted to onboard. I'll take you guys through what I did this week, my thought process, how I prioritize features like offline mode, quick ad, and onboarding, and the steps that I use to improve retention. Attention. If you're new here, welcome to the video. My name is Chris and I build productivity apps and I try to document everything I'm learning to share with you guys on this channel. Okay, so real quick, how did I get these first 10 users? I had a waitlist set up the minute I started building this app and that's my recommendation for anyone building an app, just get a waitlist out as soon as possible. So I had this waitlist and as I started building, I was posting about it everywhere on TikTok, on Twitter, on Instagram. That's where I got the first few signups. So I got five people from the waitlist and then I picked five people that I knew would give really good feedback. And these were just people I knew from online. Some of them are not necessarily in the target audience, but that's okay. I just needed some first reactions to see if there was anything glaring that I needed to fix. Once I onboarded these 10 people, the feedback started rolling in. And the first thing that I heard was people felt overwhelmed. They were just thrown into the app. There was absolutely no onboarding. And some of them had used calorie tracking apps in the past that asked them a lot of questions like their height, their weight, all this stuff. And they were fully expecting that to happen here. And when it didn't, they were kind of thrown off. So I decided to build it. And I specifically decided to spend three times longer on the onboarding than any other app that I built in the past. And let me explain why. I was studying other apps in the space and I even watched a couple of interviews from other founders who have launched calorie tracking apps. And something I noticed is they had these really long onboarding processes. And in one interview, one app was mentioning that they noticed that the longer the onboarding was, the more people tended to stick with the app after they signed up, which is really counterintuitive because you'd think that if the onboarding is really long, people would get annoyed and they drop off. But it's a weird psychological thing where they feel more invested as they start going through those steps. Onboarding is really tricky because no one wants to go through it. So we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how do we make this not feel like filling out a form at a doctor's office, but something people actually wanted to go through. So I spent a few days on this and I got my fiance to help make illustrations. So these are hand-drawn, custom-made illustrations and she actually animated them in Procreate. And when you go through the onboarding, you will see these custom illustrations of Amy the cat in different poses, depending on what the information on the screen is. And I'm so glad we did this because now it is one of the most complimented parts of the app. I am not making this up. Someone actually said that they signed up twice just so they can go through the onboarding again. That is not a normal thing. And I think it's because people were very drawn to these animations and they were very curious, okay, what is the next one going to be? So they're actually looking forward to it. And I think it was super worth it because it set the tone that this was going to be a very high quality app. So that was the first thing I ended up building, but there were a ton of other issues that came up. The next big one was stability. Users were reporting that data was not saving, the app would crash randomly. I felt pretty bad about this, but honestly, this is why we are doing this with 10 users and not a thousand users off the bat. I had to rebuild a lot of the underlying technologies to handle these edge cases and I wanted to share two cool things that actually came out of it. First is that I was able to quickly support offline mode. Usually not something that I support this early, but two of the beta testers were actually in New York City and they told me that the app was not working in the subway, which makes sense. There's no internet underground, but since this is a notes app and you never know when users are gonna wanna quickly jot down what they ate, I needed to support this edge case. So now when you're offline, there's a little indicator that says you're offline. And now when you type food, you'll see on the right that it's being queued for processing when you're back online. Before users would type and then just nothing would happen and they wouldn't know what's going on. Now they can directly see, oh, it's because I'm offline and when I come back online, it's gonna process again. Might not seem important, but if I didn't have that and a user typed and it just didn't save or it failed, this is gonna add a lot of friction where they're not gonna trust the app and then they would probably churn and stop using it. Another cool edge case I fixed was time zone support. So I supported the ability for users to change their time zone. This also probably seems like overkill, why am I working at this stage? But there was a user who was reporting that they were traveling and they noticed that when they changed time zones, the food was just appearing on the wrong day. I'm really glad I tackled this early because I had to make a bunch of database changes that would have been such a pain if I had to migrate all the data when I had a thousand users. So much easier to make these type of changes with just 10 users. Very glad that that was caught. So there were a lot of these little features, but after two days, the app is way more stable. After addressing all the stability issues, I moved on to the next piece of feedback. Turns out people eat a lot of the same thing every day, which makes sense. I actually eat the same breakfast tacos basically every single morning, and they were getting really annoyed that they had to type the same thing over and over again each day. I made this cool feature where you can actually save certain meals and quickly insert them with one tap. There's a meal that you added you wanna save, you can just click this button, and then on the top right, there's gonna be an option to save it. And then when you're in the app, you can now click this button to quickly add meals just instantly. This is great if you eat the same thing every single day for breakfast, or you're constantly having a protein shake, for example, at random times in the day. Perfect use case for this. And this is great for me too, because now I can actually just reuse the nutrition data, and that'll actually save me an AI call. Because remember, it costs me like half a cent every time someone types something in here. 
here. So if I can avoid doing that, I will 100% take that. I'm adding all of these features like the offline mode, the quick ad. Why am I choosing to focus on this stuff and how do I know that it's actually doing anything? Everything that I'm choosing to work on is in service of one key metric and that is retention. Simply put, this is how many people stick around and keep using your app every single day. Every single little friction that a user encounters, whether it be the data not saving or it shows the incorrect nutrition information, all of this stuff does degrade user trust and it causes them to just stop using the app. Every time I solve one of these things, it reduces friction, which then increases their chance of retention. So the next thing I implemented was the analytics system to track retention. And if you've been following my channel, you know that I use POSOG for all of my analytics stuff. Huge shout out to them for actually sponsoring this video. But again, even if they weren't sponsoring, this is the tool that I would be recommending. I have another video focused on analytics. I'll probably just link it in the description below. So we're not going to go into that. But I did want to take some time to show some of the charts and the things that I'm monitoring this early on to try to improve retention. This is stuff that is really important to set up before I onboard those next 200 users. So this is Postdoc. This is one of the dashboards I set up. It's pretty empty right now because there's not many users using it, but these are the core graphs that I'm right now looking at. So the first one that's really important is I want to see week one retention. The way that you interpret this graph is this is the percentage of people that stick around every single day. We can see it's October 31st at the time of recording. Happy Halloween. There's 23 people that signed up for the app at this point and at this time, 100% of the people are still using it on this day, which makes sense. They just signed up, so technically they used it here. By tomorrow, when I come back here, we're going to see this percentage likely change. Let's say that it's 50% this next day. That means that 50% of the 23 people who signed up on this day are still using it. This is going to completely fill up over the next week, and it's gonna be really fun to see what the graph looks like. And obviously we want this number to go up. So as we start working off user feedback and building features, it's what we're gonna be looking at. Another important thing is how many people after sign up are actually doing the core action. And the core action here is logging food. You can see here that 23 people signed up and about 73% of people ended up actually logging food. And you might be wondering, well, why would they not log food? I mean, they signed up for this app. Why would they not just go use it? Think about it like this. This is a food app. What if they signed up early in the morning and they just haven't eaten anything that day? There's really nothing for them to log. So there are a bunch of cases here where it is very reasonable that someone would sign up and not actually log anything or retroactively log the food. And that's why it's really important to set up things like reminders, for example, because let's say they don't log something immediately. Then two hours later, I can just remind them and hopefully that'll get them to come back in the app and then they actually will take the core action. Something that I asked for on the the onboarding is I let people turn on reminders. Something I want to do is really make sure people are turning those on. So this is really important, but you can see that 22 people signed up and around 50% of them turned this on. So something now I'm probably going to work on is how can I optimize this screen to get them to opt in for those reminders. I will be building out this dashboard to try to add a lot more metrics that we're looking at, but this is a really good start before I onboard those first 200 people. Another cool thing I want to show with PostHog is I'm using a feature called LLM Analytics. So they also have this really cool feature where they integrate with the AI stuff so you can actually track all of the costs that are happening in your app. And for an app like mine where I'm trying to figure out what to price the app, this is really important. So that's how I'm actually tracking all the costs. I'm already using it to track the product analytics and retention. I might as well also use it for their AI analytics feature. You can see here over the last seven days, my costs have been around $5. They have some other cool metrics here. Like I can see what is the average cost per user. It looks like it's about 13 cents per user at this point. This is going to be a very important one for me to track. Uh, and then if you have other models that you're using, like I was testing out a bunch of different perplexity models, I can see which model is costing the most. Very powerful stuff and I'm really happy it lives with the product analytics retention stuff that we were looking at earlier. I'll leave a link in the description if you want to go check out PostHog. I would offer a discount code, but it is so cheap and I think most people will probably stick under their free plan to be honest. So no discount code, but if you want to support the channel, please tell them that I sent you. Okay, so let's keep going with the features. The next piece of feedback that I got from people was sometimes the nutrition looked a little bit off, but I don't really know how to edit it. I have this really cool aim thought process section that shows you how it calculated the calories. If the calories looked a bit off, what people would do is they would just close it, they would go re-edit the original food and try to re-prompt it almost, but that was super annoying. So I tried coming up with a better solution, built this feature where you can click a button and then you can request edits on basically anything. You can even just say something like, hey, the calories seem a little bit underestimated. Can you go ahead and just bump it up a little bit? And then Amy will go ahead and do that, show you the changes, and then you can either reject or approve those changes. I actually posted that initial concept of this on Twitter, got a lot of really good feedback. So there's still a bunch of improvements I need to make, but I was able to get the initial version shipped and I'm excited to 
see if that helps people out. And the last thing I added before onboarding the next 200 people was a feedback board. I have a feedback board in every single one of my apps and it is hands down the most impactful thing that I have done for all of my apps. For this app, I'm using a tool called User Jot and it integrates directly into the apps. They go to settings, they scroll down and there's a place to leave feedback. When they click it, this page is gonna open with the board and they're gonna be able to leave feedback or more importantly, upvote feedback that they wanna see. So that means the most requested features are just gonna naturally rise to the top and I'll have a really strong signal of what I should be prioritizing. Even though I just implemented this and only a handful of users have been able to use it, I'm already very impressed with the type of feedback that I'm receiving. I'm incredibly excited to see what's gonna happen when I onboard the 200 people and they get access to this feedback board. I think we're gonna see some really cool suggestions in there. I am not sponsored or affiliated with UserJot. I'm just a fan of the product. So I'll leave a link in the description and a code for one month free. I don't get anything from using the code, but if you wanna use it, I'll leave it there so you can check it out. And that was everything I shipped in the week. Huge shout out to the 10 users who took the time to beta test it. Thank you guys so much for doing that. The next step is to onboard the next 200 users and we're gonna do the exact same thing all over again. I hope this gave a good glimpse into my building process, how I think about feature prioritization, how I improve retention. But if you like this kind of content, check out my Instagram and TikTok. I post almost every other day about building productivity apps and there's a lot of behind the scenes of building this app in particular if you wanna go check that out. And obviously if you like this content, don't forget to subscribe. But thank you guys so much for sticking around and I will see you guys in the next video.